Okay, we're ready to get started. Thank you, everybody, as we figured out our technology. Um, so hello, I'm going to talk to you today about a collaborative project with my colleague Emily Nutwell, who have unfortunately could not join me, but there she is, pictured, teaching in our secondary school data science class that we taught this past January. I am going to talk a little bit more about that course later in the presentation, but first I want to talk about the context in which we developed it. Um, which was um, as part of a project sponsored by a funder in the United States called the Public Interest Technology University Network, who are thought leaders in this new emerging field of public interest tech. Um, this was a relatively new term to me um, until I became engaged in this project about a year and a half ago, and so I am not an official spokesperson for public interest tech, um, but I'm an enthusiast and advocate and I wanna spread the word. So brief agenda, as I said, we... <laughs> we are going to do a little bit of defining of public interest tech, what I mean by that term, why use it instead of some other related terms. Going to go through some project examples, including the high school data science course that I mentioned on the last slide, and then ending just with a quick slide of resources for how could you engage in public interest tech if you are not already. Um, so starting with a definition from the Public Interest Technology University Network that I mentioned. They refer to PIT, as it is sometimes abbreviated, as a set of practices to design, deploy, and govern technology in ways that advance the public interest. Now that sounds... Oh, sure. <laughs> okay. Uh, da, 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 da. So that sounds pretty good, but I think that there are two problems with this definition. One is it's a little bit tautological, right? It defines public interest tech by including the words public interest and technology, so it doesn't tell you a lot more. And two, it might sound a little bit familiar. Um, so I created a word cloud here with some of the other terminology that some of you may be used to using in descriptions of your work. So things here like civic tech, activist technology, open data, gov tech, public innovation, data for good, there are tons of these. Um, but that being said, I do think that public interest tech is a little bit different than some of these um, in that it offers the opportunity to have kind of an umbrella term that is broader than any of these alone. Um, and it's broader in multiple ways. One, it doesn't focus on any type of technology. So the project that I was talking about with a secondary school data science course is obviously within the world of data and data science. Um, but you might also have public interest tech projects that are related to things like cybersecurity or broadband access. Um, and so PIT is an umbrella that encompasses all of those. Similarly, it's not focused on any one method. So a couple of the terms that I have up here include things like translational research or action research that are approaches to certain sorts of public interest projects. Um, PIT encompasses all of those, or can anyway. Um, and then finally, it also is not focused on any one sector. So some of these terminologies are very focused on either public sector work or academic research, um, and PIT has a home for all of those. Um, so having said a little bit about what it's not, that it's broader than all of these other things, I wanted to give um, a couple of key characteristics for what it really is. Um, so first, it relies on diverse engagement. So PIT is not just for computer scientists or other type of, types of technologists, um, but for all sorts of other people who are necessary to make a technology-driven world equitable and to make it work. So that can include you know, different types of humanistic researchers, policy makers, journalists. Um, I'm a librarian, which I, I've heard there's a few out there. I haven't connected with any of you yet. Please find me. <laughs> um, and um, a key to this too, the last word under this diverse engagement is that it is also often participatory. We have to actually engage citizenry in the design of technology rather than deliver it to them without any consultation. Um, which really brings me to that second concept of design thinking. So ideally, public interest technology is people-focused, um, which includes being transparent in its methods, responsive to actual needs, and again, participatory. You cannot know what those needs are without actually engaging the people who are going to utilize the technologies you're talking about. Um, and then finally, public interest technology is also really future-focused. Um, so that can include things like policy and governance of technology, but it's also really focused on workforce development. And in this way, it draws on the roots of another public interest field, which is public interest law. 
So the idea here is that we need pathways to careers in technology in the public interest. There are many organizations, many individuals that are already doing this work, but we do it on, under so many different names that if you say, I want to be a public interest technologist, there's not one pathway to do so within our current university training systems or within the way that jobs and careers are currently advertised. Um, so I want to, to conclude this a little bit here on another attempt at a definition. This one is taken from one of the first books talking about public interest technology, and it's actually two separate quotes that I've kind of stitched together because I think I, they do a nice job of reflecting this kind of value forward definition of public interest technology. So first, there is no solving the world's hardest problems without governments and institutions that really work for people. And technology can play a critical role in that, but it is never the solution alone. So that goes back to those concepts that I was talking about on the previous slide about the fact that it needs to be participatory. It needs to be informed by on the ground needs. It needs to be multi-sector. It needs to be multidisciplinary. It needs individuals that are in different sorts of roles. Um, and lastly, before we get into some of the project examples, I just wanted to touch a little bit on the benefits of using the same words in talking about this sort of public interest facing work. Um, so these are a, a couple of examples of organizations that are already using public interest technology as a term to describe this type of work. It includes things like tech communities like Mozilla, the US National Science Foundation as a scientific research sponsor, and even the chief technology officer in the US White House. Um, and so really, one of the key advantages of using the same terminology as I've, I've tried to say previously is that it makes it easier to find your people. <laughs> that includes finding jobs that are relevant, colleagues to network with, funding opportunities. You know, it is great to have more specific terminology as well, but this umbrella term just helps to create pathways and helps people find one another. Um, a common refrain um, at the Public Interest Technology University Network's annual convening is this idea of, gosh, I've been doing this my whole career and I didn't know how to find everyone. Um, so if this sounds familiar, good. It's a way to find people. Um, so shifting from definitions to some actual more concrete examples, because sometimes talking about it in theory really doesn't give you an idea of what it looks like on the ground. Um, as promised, I'm going to start with my own project about the secondary school data science course. So for my US-based colleagues, that's high school. I'm trying to use more inclusive language there. So these, this was a, a class with students between the ages of 14 and 17. Um, and I taught this course with my colleague Emily Nutwell, as I mentioned before. But we also had a team with um, stakeholders from different backgrounds as well. So we collaborated with a high school math teacher. Um, we worked with a physics professor. Um, and then we also had an education PhD student on our team. And we called this course Data for Healthy Communities. It was a 15-hour enrichment course um, taught over three weeks in a public high school in Columbus, Ohio. And we did an evaluation for this as well and are releasing all of the modules as open educational resources. Uh, for this particular audience, Let's unplug and plug back in and see what happens. Um, because we have limited time, I will keep talking while I try and do this. So this slide starts by saying, why spreadsheets? Um, and I was just going to say that's not something that I think has to be argued quite as much to this audience. CSV Conf, of course, loves spreadsheets. Um, but I've also talked about this course at, for example, computer science conferences. Um, who are wondering why. Because unlike most open educational resources for data science, our course doesn't teach students to code. Um, it's entirely based in Microsoft Excel. And it focuses on uh, much simpler concepts. It is not a coding course. Um, so why is that? There are a couple of reasons. Um, <laughs> So in our, in our home state of Ohio, um, access to computer science courses is still really uneven. Um, so if the slide were up there, you would see some statistics now, which is that about 48% of our high schools, our secondary schools, have a computer science class. So only about a half of them. 
And as you might expect, that is concentrated in uh, more well-off areas and typically within urban areas. Um, but there's another problem here too, which is the second stat, which is only about three and a half percent of students in the state took one of those courses in the previous year. Um, so students are opting out of computer science even when it's available. Um, now, not every student needs to be a technologist, which is perhaps why they are opting out. Again, part of this framework of public interest technology is that it requires multiple perspectives. However, basic data literacy is increasingly important um, in all sorts of professions, as well as for civic engagement. So part of the framework of this course is broadening access to those fundamental data literacy and computing concepts and bringing them to other curricular areas. So our course is taught within the context of public health um, and again is meant to just broaden access to computing outside of that computer science context. So a quick outline of what this course contains. Um, so it starts with placing data into context in two ways. First, um, it started with an exploration of jobs within public interest technology. There are a few public interest tech job boards that that public interest tech university network curates, um, which was really intended to help students see themselves in the course that was about to start. So even if, you know, we focused on a little bit of, of kind of simple data analysis, even if they were like, nah, this isn't for me, Starting out with this idea of there is a place for you here in this type of inquiry because there are multiple types of roles connected to it. Um, we then introduced um, kind of some core principles of public health um, as well as some sources of public health data. Um, a key attribute of our course was that it used entirely um, publicly available data sets, which are at the bottom of each of these sections here. Um, so when we first introduced public health data, we looked at some asthma data. Um, from the um, Center for Disease Control's National Health Interview Survey. We then went into kind of some foundational skill building modules, focused on tidy data principles for organizing data. So again, we're not teaching R, but these are concepts that are transferable to other contexts. Um, Excel formulas um, as a way to introduce the concept of a function um, with the idea that all of these skills are things that could be built upon in a later computational computer science course, um, but that there is a more introductory way to teach them than by starting with a coding language. Um, so sorting and filtering, subsetting, and finally visualization. And each of these modules was really in support of preparing them for a data analytics project, um, which instructed them through using a data set called the Environmental Justice Index, um, both exploring it online through web maps, doing some exploratory data analysis in Excel, and finally, using it to make an argument with data. Um, I'm almost um, at time. I've got five minutes and want to leave time for questions, so I'm not going to expound on the project, but I'm happy to talk about this another time if you'd like. Um, and I do want to briefly touch, though, on these other PIT examples, just because you know the project that I've been involved with is one way that PIT can be done, and I really wanted to communicate the breadth. So a couple of examples here. The Consortium of Cybersecurity Clinics is a network of almost two dozen university programs that pair students with nonprofits or local governments um, in a clinic model of cybersecurity challenges. Um, so this is based on the concept of you know, law clinics, health clinics that use authentic learning opportunities to help teach students and are also advantageous to local communities. So this is a technology application of that. Um, the data.org capacity accelerator network is a um, organization that has hubs in the United States, across the African continent, and in India that are working to train one million public interest technology data specialists um, by 2032. And they approach this both through university level training, but also for workforce development of current professionals. Um, and then lastly, I've got the PIT Policy Lab, which is based here in Mexico, and is a network of public interest tech consultants that help bring PIT expertise to local organizations. And then, as promised, ending on resources, I'll leave these up here as we transition into a little bit of Q&A if anybody has questions. Hi, 
Hey, thanks for the talk, that was great. I'd love to hear a little more about what you're seeing qualitatively, whether students are identifying with these careers at the secondary and um, college level. Um, and maybe something about like, if you see any, like that connecting between academia and the nonprofit or public sector work. Okay, so the, the first question first, just qualitative impressions. Um, at the secondary level, I've really taught this one course, so I have about 30 students that I can give you impressions from. Um, but broadly speaking, some things that I've heard from my other colleagues within the Public Interest Technology University Network is, yes, absolutely, students are trying to find these sorts of careers. You know, we often find that um, young people lead social movements, and so they are looking for ways to translate their values into careers. Um, and we did find it within the context of the course that we taught in the high school, helpful for students to be able to see ways that they could engage even if they did not identify as tech people. Um, and then your second question, Sure, so kind of like multi-sector engagement. Um, I think it's, it's complicated. This is um, kind of a, a passion point of mine. I came to academia by way of, of working in the public sector in child welfare, um, which is an area that I think is, is very left behind um, in terms of investment in technology. Um, and a kind of another vein of my scholarship is, is working back with those organizations. So I think there are a lot of individuals that are passionate about it, but again, one of the gaps I think is, is finding other people who are doing this, finding better ways to communicate its value within um, an academic environment that has very strict incentives for what researchers are expected to be doing. And I think it's helpful to have established communities, especially something like the Public Tech Interest University Network that helps with establishing this as a field, which makes it easier to communicate that value and also makes it easier for individuals from different sectors to find one another. Okay, I think we might just have time for one more question. So I'm gonna... Yeah, so I've been working in the open data space for more than a decade and I always thought high school students would be perfect, especially since we don't do civics anymore in the United States that were, if, has there been any thought about mixing this with this focus on STEM to make them learn about their environment, about, you know, where they are by, you know, using the, f the focus of public interest lens? Yep. Yeah, so there, there are a lot of people that are trying to answer this question of how do we bring data science or computer science to other areas, and part of that is because it's kind of an orphan subject, right? Like there are computer science classes, but as data science is, is being seen as important, the question of like whether it's a standalone class or whether it should replace an existing math class, be an alternative to an existing math class, um, has been hard to answer from like a curricular design perspective. Um, and so you'll see in the research a lot of discussion about this concept of like teaching across the curriculum. So how do we integrate um, data sources and data literacy concepts into other areas, um, which is part of kind of the, the framework of the course that we were teaching. You'll also sometimes see this as um, like CS for computer science or DS for data science plus X um, as some of the other language that's being used in the literature. Um, so there are other examples of this. I'm not sure that it's always so public interest focused, um, but the idea of needing to find a home for data science that doesn't rely on students self-identifying as technologists is definitely an active area of discussion. 